we say charge on. We commit to do extraordinary things. It's a catalyst for action. To put in the work. To keep trying. It's a challenge. From the University of Santa Florida, beautiful Rosen campus in the city beautiful of Orlando. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I am Dr. Robertico Cross, Associate Dean for Research and Administration. We honor Dr. Abraham Pizam, founding dean of the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. 50 years ago, he achieved his PhD and the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series will take a look at the evolution of the hospitality and tourism industry through the eyes of some of the pioneers in this field of education. The Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series will conclude in April 2021. For those of you who attended our first lecture with Dr. Jafar Jafari on October 23rd, thank you for attending our lecture again. Our first lecture revealed insightful contours of the evolution of the tourism and hospitality scholarship. It concluded with a critical swing at the tension between theory and practice. For those of you who attend our distinguished lecture series for the first time, welcome. 50 years ago, Dr. Abraham Pizam defended his dissertation, some socio-psychological correlates of innovation within industrial suggestion systems. The results of the study found that personal characteristics of creativity, social differentiation, motivational source, and idea source are crucial for innovativeness. The topic of innovativeness is as timely as ever, especially in these trying times. Today we have another interesting lecture. And at this point, I would like to say good morning to my co-host, Dr. Alan Fayal. Good morning, Alan. Lovely, thank you, Tika. And wonderful to see you, Ari, and well, welcome to the Rosen College, albeit virtually. And hopefully we won't interrupt your evening in Tel Aviv too much. Ari, I think if you recall, we first met in Bournemouth in 2009. Um, I've read your work, but it's the first time I met you in person. And I think what always struck me, what was a busy conference, you always had a very, very large crowd around you. Always engaging, always thought provoking, and most important, you always having fun. So you were struck in my mind. And mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, Ari, I, th I think you'll probably recall you were one of the very first to sign up as the one of the editorial board members for the Journal of Destination Marketing Management, uh, which was a big yeah. step at the time. And I can't imagine how many reviews you have completed since. So very, very grateful for your service and thank you for your time today. And for all those uh, listening and tuning in, um, I will be hosting the questions. So please, I, I know Ari will like very controversial, thoughtful questions. So please feel free uh, to include them in the chat function, and then I will uh, direct them to, to Ari uh, when we get towards the end of the session. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Ari. And I'm going to uh, welcome our Dean now, who's just going to say a few words. So good morning, Dean. Good morning, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, greetings from UCF Rosen College of Hospitality Management, and welcome to our, this is the session number two, the Dean's uh, Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, honoring our founding dean, uh, Dr. Abraham Pizam. 
Um, I believe that many of you know a very well, but just for those of you who need a little bit of refresher, uh, I have a little short bio to share uh, with you. Um, Professor Pisam is the uh, Linder Chapin Eminent Scholar Chair in Tourism Management uh, at the University of uh, Central Florida Rosen College of Hospitality Management. Uh, he is also the founding dean of the college and has served in that role for more than 15 years until his return to faculty in 2018. Uh, Professor Bissam is widely known in the field of hospital and tourism management and con has conducted research projects, lectured, and has served as a consultant in more than 30 countries. He has held various academic positions in the USA, UK, France, Austria, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Israel, and Switzerland, and has authored more than 160 scientific publications and 10 books, is the founding editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Hospitality Management, and serves on the, on the editorial boards of 20 academic journals. Uh, Professor Pizam has conducted consulting and research projects for a variety of international, national, and regional tourism organizations. Uh, though I know it is very difficult to describe APE in a few words, um, but uh, if I have to, I would like to use the following uh, keywords. Definitely, APE, you are architect, uh, innovator, mentor, leader, and a scholar. Remember, I did not use the word researcher because I believe there's a difference between scholar and the researcher, and obviously, platform builder. Uh, you are inspiration for many of us sitting here, and uh, probably you are the best example for sustained excellence in uh, scholarship. Uh, we are very, very grateful today that the speaker series is kicked off by uh, really the support of another great scholar in the tourism research community, uh, community professor Ari Reichel, who is a, a friend of APE. I hope this series will contribute to the advancements of tourism research um, as a frontier of knowledge uh, creation. Uh, I know there are still a lot of discussions, debates as to whether uh, tourism is a field of study or discipline, uh, but we are progressing towards a research journey supported by more rigorous and scientific methods. Uh, we are moving from borrowing theories and concepts from other disciplines to gradually making contributions to other disciplines. So this is reflected by the Rosen College uh, strategy and philosophy of teaching of treating hospitality, not necessarily as an industry, but more importantly, as a culture which can be extended into other related service areas where the culture of hospitality is desired, covering the entire spectrum of hospitality ecosystem, ranging from the traditional hospitality to hedonic hospitality, all the way to utilitarian hospitality. Uh, so this philosophy and, uh, and approach has created numerous research angles and opportunities for faculty and graduate students. Uh, the interest in the studies of tourism hospitality has grown and expanding over the years, uh, you know, which is really reflected by the number of journals, depending on how you count them, several hundred of them already. Uh, programs, students, particularly graduate students enrolled uh, in a program we call the T-generation, the tourism generation researchers and the scholars. So uh, we need some inspiration. Um, from uh, two pioneers uh, with around uh, 100 years of combined contribution to tourism research and, and, and education, uh, who have really witnessed and experienced the entire history, evolution and the revolution of tourism uh, research, including its ups and downs. Um, so um, I hope you will enjoy the session. Um, so I will give the floor to Abe uh, to probably, properly introduce your friend, Professor uh, Ari. Hey, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Wang, and uh, welcome everybody to Rosen College. Uh, again, my thanks for organizing uh, that in my honor. I'm humbled and impressed by the speakers and the organizers as well. Uh, let me now start to introduce my colleague and friend, Ari Ariko. Um, First, uh, a lesson in Hebrew. The word Aryeh in Hebrew means lion. And he really represents a lion among sheep. We are all sheep compared to Aryeh, who is a lion among his peers. 
Second, Arya and myself have intersected throughout times in many places and many years. I met Arya the first time when he was a graduate student at Tel Aviv University after I came back from my PhD at Cornell and joined the Rex of the business school as an assistant professor. Arya became soon my research assistant and worked with me while he was studying for his MBA. In the following years, I left Tel Aviv University and I joined the University of Massachusetts. And guess what? Arya came as well. And he left Tel Aviv University and joined the University of Massachusetts in the business school. And at that time, the department of HRTA, Hotel, Restaurant and Travel Administration, did not have a PhD program, but he joined the PhD program in the College of Business. He worked with another giant in his time, George Audiorn, who was his mentor in the business school. And I became his mentor in the hospitality and tourism and joined his dissertation committee. Arya, upon completion of his doctoral degree, joined a university that I was previously studying at. So again, we intersected. He joined NYU, where I did my master's degree. Later on, he moved to uh, Israel. He went back to Israel and, like myself, started a hospitality and tourism department at Ben-Gurion University, the first of its kind in Israel, and later also started a branch campus in Eilat, the city of Eilat on the Red Sea. Similar to my career progression, he also became a dean uh, of the management school at Ben Gurion University and served a quite a number of years uh, until he went back uh, to uh, the faculty member. Uh, as you can see, our uh, path were identical, were parallel and similar. Even our undergraduate degrees were similar. He had an undergraduate degree in sociology, and so did I. So everything all was similar and parallel. Not only did we work together, but we were close friends. And I spent numerous times in my house with my kids, babysitting for my kids, and knows my wife very well. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you a great friend, a scholar like no one, and a lion among sheep, my friend and colleague, Arya Reichel. Arya, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Abe. I have to admit, I'm glad that people do not see me in close up because I'm in tears. Seriously, Abe, you summarized the major part of my life. And as we can tell, you had a great part in forming it. And it, you really touched my heart the way that you described it. And think about it, the great influence that you had on me throughout the years. You are the perfect model of a mentor, by all means. And it all started by chance. It was 1974. I was admitted to Tel Aviv Business School. And I said to myself, why work shifts in the International Telephone Exchange? See if you can have 
a research assistant job. So I asked the secretary, by chance, you know, there is this American author, Paul Oster, and he writes a lot about chances. You know, a person turns right instead of turning left. How is life or her life changed because of that? And I made a, a left turn, bump into a secretary, and I said, listen, my name is so-and-so. I'm interested in a, in a job as a research assistant. She said, yes, Dr. Pizan started the project, and I know that he's interested in research assistant. And the rest is history. That's how we started it all. And that, and you were a role model for me all those years, and especially in the research project that I'm talking about. You were the core of it. You were the source, the origin of what I'm going to describe in a few minutes. So thank you very much for your guidance and whatever you gave me. It's with me and it is highly appreciated. And as I said, very, very exciting beyond words. Before I go on, I would like uh, to thank the faculty and the staff of UCF for inviting me and arranging for this presentation. I do not take it for granted. It's very kind of you guys. I also would like to thank my colleague, Galia Fuchs, who helped me dealing with some of the technical issues that I'm not great with. And what I would like to talk about today is about our tourist as a consumer who takes risks. And the question is, are we talking about tourists who are irrational and they're looking for risk or maybe the risk is calculated and they know what they're doing. So in order to try to answer this, these questions, I'm going to fly with you in spite of the COVID pandemic. I'm gonna take you on a plane or, or imagination to some exotic places and there we will check our tourists, how they behave in terms of risk. And we will see if they are rational, irrational, how, to, how they handle risk, etc. So with your permission, I will try to get to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, the, the title is Sensation Seekers, Risk Takers, and Dark Heritage Tourists. Are we here for pain or pleasure? Okay, I'm asking this question in a way, in a provocative way, because when we come from the literature of, let's say, consumer behavior, the assumption is always about hedonism. But when we examine tourists, we see an entirely different picture, a much more colorful, a much more diverse, a much more interesting phenomena. Okay? And I would like um, to relate to some questions that hopefully I will be able to cover in our discussion today. I don't promise that we will be able to cover all of them. I'm a bit pretentious in terms of being able to cover all of them. Uh, one question that is related directly to studies with Abe. Are sensation seekers actually risk takers? Is it the same thing? If we talk about tourists, do they 
avoid risk or are they attracted to it? And if you're talking about risk, what are the risks? And then if we focus on some types of terror, I have some interesting cases involving terror risks. I'm going to take you to Sinai, and I'm going to take you to the West Bank, to the Palestinian West Bank. And then I'm going to calm you down in the lowest place on earth in the Dead Sea, OK? And if we have some time, which I doubt, I may speak to you about dark heritage sites why people should go to places where they should feel horrible. And they go to these places. So are they masochist? Is there something wrong with them? So let's try to answer some of these questions, at least some of them, with the time permitted. And I should give credit to Abe for the first time that he introduced me to the concept of sensation seekers. 2001, a study initiated by Abe and conducted also with another colleague that we will see his name on in the presentation, Nati Urieli, uh, is with me in Be'er Sheva. And we, we, we based on discussion on Zuckerman conceptualization of sensation seekers. And to, to do it very briefly, um, we distinguish between those who are very high on the sensation seeking score on this scale. And to make it short, they are for extreme sports and they're very independent, making their own travel arrangement. Now, Look at the year. We are not talking about today, where it is the most obvious thing to do that you plan everything. 20 years ago, there were still travel agency flourishing, etc. It wasn't necessarily very common that you do all your travel arrangement. On the other end, those who, who, who scored low in terms of this trade, this trade of sensation seeking were interested in tr um, travel with tour guides, package tours with family and friends, man-made attractions. I would say Orlando would be an excellent destination. And I say it, please, not ironically, I say it empirically because all the wonderful attractions in Orlando would perfectly fit this particular segments. So that was the work that Abe initiated in 2001. Then we advance starting questions about risk actually. We started with sensation seeking, but we realized, come on, I mean, something is missing in the equation. Risk, risky behavior, okay? And then we started asking ourselves, what is the relationship between the trait, okay? And sensation seeking, okay, and risk taking. And Abe, managed, I would use the word manage and initiated an 11 country comparative study. That was quite a project. 2004 it was published in JTR. And the interesting finding, which I think that has to do also with, you know, with the social psychological literature is that we are talking about two different dimensions, okay? The correlation between the two dimensions was 0.56, okay? So Zuckerman sensation seeking scale and Jackson scale, which 
measured risk, but then we used it, were correlated, but they were not identical. So this research did not, I would say, package the issue, but raised more interesting questions. As a matter of fact, it opened the window for more and more research that we've been conducted, that has been conducted during the years to come. And I just to, would like to, to mention one thing about when, we, when I talked about the contribution from tourism to the literature in social psychology. And I'm going back to Abe. Apart from his impact, as shown in the thinking related to these studies, there is one thing about Abe that I remember from 1974. Abe never permitted to look at our discipline as something second rate. This is something that we should never forget. He is one of the leaders who never expect, who never accepted any attempt to belittle us. And believe me, in 1974, it wasn't something easy. It's not easy. I remember with the first issues of Annals of Tourism Research, boy, they looked so miserable that probably Jafar doesn't want to remember. But Abe kept pushing. He believed in the discipline and whenever he went, and he mentioned that there were trajectories that we, we were together, he never accepted any hint or any attempt to belittle our field. So back to what I'm trying to, to convey here in this research, that the two phenomenon, phenomena, risk and sensation seeking from this 11 country study, it was clear, totally clear, crystal clear that we are talking about two different issues. Okay, and this gave us, I would say, the push to continue doing our research. Okay, which brings me to a study that was done with two of my colleagues, Galia Fuchs and Nati Urielli. And we did it in uh, 2006. And what we did, First of all, we relied on, I think, classical work of many, many distinguished scholars. I just mentioned four names because they were the first four names on the list. I didn't want to cover, I mean, everything with names. So I mentioned Lepp and Gibson, Royal and Fessenmayer, Sandmez and Graf, and many, many other scholars. Some of them are really good personal friends. And they did a lot of work about risk. It seems that interest of scholars in risk has been increasing throughout the years. Uh, since I would say 2001, you would see more and more studies about it. And in this particular study, that we did on, uh, on backpackers, its main contribution is to make some order in the multitude of risk that has been mentioned in the literature. So we covered, I would say dozens types of risk that were mentioned in the literature. And we came up with clusters, okay, based on factor analysis, and you see it on the screen, and I'm not going to cite everything on the screen, but I would like to relate to some clusters 
that initially got us a lot of criticism. People criticized me when I presented it in conferences. Oh boy, oh boy, that was a real casus belli. In English, a cause of, for war. What is socio-psychological risk? Where did you get it from? What does it mean? What do you mean that your friends and family may think badly about you if you go to a particular destination? When we first presented it, I tell you, there was an incredible rejection of this concept. I think by now, given the plethora of studies about animosity, animosity between countries, animosity between cultures, unfortunately, there is still animosity and I don't want to dwell on it. People understand now when we talk about this kind of social psychological risk, okay? That there are some destinations that you don't want to discuss with your family and friends. Maybe they will change your opinion about you and so on and so forth. I don't want to get into details, okay? Um, something else that I'd like to raise from this list when we first talked about masses, okay, commercialized, okay, overcrowded, boy, I tell you that people looked at us as if we came from Mars. Truly, some geographers did talk about capacity, they did, but they didn't talk about it as a risk factor from the point of view of the tourist who, for example, goes to Amsterdam in the Netherlands, okay? And would consider masses or overcrowdedness as a risk factor in the decision, okay? So um, as the years go by, at least I found out that our results are as fresh as ever and as meaningful as ever, although they are from 2006 and although should be confided presumably only to backpackers, you know, to be perfectly clear about it. But the message that I'm trying to, to convey here is that risk factors that looked strange and as you would say in America, off the wall are certainly um, crystallized and they're there. It's not something imaginary that we found. Moving right along, I'm going to dwell or emphasize terror risks, okay? And they, there is a very interesting example. Um, it's a study based on, a, on a ethnographic research in the Sinai. Now I mentioned earlier the issue of animosity. And we should not hide the fact that for generations, there was animosity between Israelis and Egyptians. The sources of this animosity are not here to be analyzed. Let's take them as a, let's take this animosity as given. And I will just give you a hint that although the peace agreement was signed maybe 30 or so years ago, there is still, a, I would say, a ban of a Egyptian to come and visit Israel as tourists. You don't, they're doing it. 
because you will be socially penalized and uh, crucified, so to speak. Um, but the one spot which flourishes in spite of the animosity is Sinai. Israelis flocked to Sinai in spite of animosity and in spite of terror, terror attacks that take place there. Uh, it's not in the um, headlines of the newspaper, but there is an incredible extension of what is known as ISIS in Sinai. And people will have to be extremely careful when they go there. And there is constant uh, American State Department warning about Sinai. And of course, uh, Israeli warning against going there, a strong warning, like a red sign warning, don't go there. But Israelis do go there and they tend to go to some camps, some resorts. And how can it happen? Okay, you have animosity, you have the threat of terror and terror attacks that kill tourists did take place. So are we talking about irrational people? That's the question that I raised in the beginning of my presentation. So there are some interesting tactics that were developed in order to construct what, what Naki Uriele, based on the work of uh, Eric Cohen, called a bubble of serenity. I'm sure you all guys know Eric Cohen. And Eric Cohen, emeritus of Hebrew University in Jerusalem, wrote a lot about the tourist bubble. But this particular bubble, we call it a bubble of serenity. Um, and we found out the tactics that, uh, first of all, uh, all the people there, service suppliers, as well as clientele, in other words, the tourists, consider the area as ex-territory, okay? Because service providers, most of them come from Cairo or even from Alexandria. And for them, Sinai is like being in another country. Likewise, the Israelis, they come to Sinai. Well, it's not really Egypt, it's Sinai. And several, maybe 40 years ago, it was under our control, okay? So it's a no man's land. You can do whatever you want to. And we are friends. The common expression there is my friend, okay? You are not a, a room keeper. You are not a bartender. You are my friend. Everybody is a friend. That's the common expression, my friend. And the, the, the interaction between the two, I would say the two nations has to do with stressing similarities. Oh, it's like we're the same. We like the same hummus, we like tahini, we like falafel, we, 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 we like this music. Um, what we call Middle Eastern music, aren't we similar? So there is no need to worry about it, no need to, uh, to be afraid of, aren't we similar? So all of the history, all of the fears are redundant, not necessary. But what we found out, ladies and gentlemen, that this wonderful bubble of serenity did burst after terror attacks. All of a sudden, the talk is differently. Oh, these Egyptians, they're inept. 
they don't have enough medical facilities. God forbid, if you are wounded in a terror attack, they don't have ambulances, they don't have doctors, they don't know how to protect the area with guides, okay? They are not up to the most advanced Western procedures. They should learn everything from America, but they don't do it and so on and so forth. So we are not similar anymore, okay? But that lasts for maybe two weeks and very gradually the serenity of the Red Sea and the feeling of, I would say, nature at its best, which is very hard to find in little busy Israel, attracts the visitor back, and we are friends again. So the bubble is recreated, okay? So no wonder there were terror attacks, and for a while we said some nasty things about each other, the bubble is back. So, are we talking about rational tourists that take, a, take advantage of a situation and tell themselves stories, so to speak? I leave it up to you to decide. But we as researchers identified the mechanism and we refused at this point to come up with judgments. Now, after we flew to the Red Sea, okay, I'm going to take you to another destination. This is the lowest spot on earth, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to take you to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has been noted for its medical contribution, mainly to people with psoriasis and other skin diseases. It does miracles. Um, the exposure to the sun and the uh, mud bath of the materials from the Dead Sea that you can see in the picture, they relax the person and it takes usually four weeks, no less than four weeks, and you get a new person. It lasts, the effect lasts for almost a year and truly you have to come back. Uh, Gallia Fuchs and I, when we did some studies about risks in times of terror attacks, in times where the Middle East was on fire and we found out that in spite of the fire all around, the havoc, the, the terrible headlines in the news on TV, etc. The statistics about tourism, foreign tourism in the Dead Sea indicates that there is no decline. Now, what's going on there? It was very interesting for us. We're interested in risk taking or risk perception. So off we went to the Red Sea, I'm sorry, to the Dead Sea, which is only an hour and a half or so from our campus in Beersheba. And what we found out, first of all, that when we checked for risk factors, we found out just I would say a minimal number of risk factors. Financial risk and a fear of natural disaster and car accidents. Well, let me tell you, they were negligible, these risk factors. Financial risk was very clear. I mean, if you go on a medical vacation to the Dead Sea, where the prices of hotels are according to the value of medical tourism, which means, ladies and gentlemen, 
very high prices, okay? Uh, there is a risk of financial. Natural disaster, you are in an area which is afflicted at times every 100 years with an earthquake. And I think that given the time, I would, I would just talk now about a most exciting group for people who are interested in risk. These are scuba divers, okay? I was asked earlier about our friend Amir Shani, PhD from UCF and uh, another protege of Abe who is with us in Be'er Sheva. So Fuchs, Reichel and Shani, we studied scuba divers. And the question is, I'm trying to, to round the things that I talked so far. Are they for risk? Are they for pleasure? Are they rational? Are they irrational? Okay. What, what are they looking for? It is clear that it's a risky sport, no doubt about it. And they tend to go to high risk places, whether it's in Mauritius or in the Dead Sea. Okay. So, we found out that when you interview them, in-depth interviews, many of them actually look for tranquility. They are looking for a very peaceful experience. Risk is not part of that experience. As a matter of fact, they don't think about it as a risky experience. For others, it's a fashionable, um, I would say even a class-related kind of activity. Because when you own the equipment and you show off all kinds of brands, it's a kind of conspicuous consumption, okay? Now there are perceived risk, but these perceived risk adjust to the to the course that all of them are expected to take. So it is, they cite the risk that are listed in the guide, okay? It means that they were good students. Do they believe in this risk? It's not clear, but they all attest to their ability to avoid the risk. They supposedly know how to reduce the risk. And one of the interesting things that we found, and we will not elaborate it, is the crucial role of the body. They never dive alone, because diving alone is really, I would say, a, a call for trouble, a real trouble. And um, it's part of what we've written here, overconfidence. And our conclusion was, and I suggested to you, that basically when we sum up our results, the only word that comes to our mind is flow. The concept of flow that was suggested by the Hungarian-American professor Mihaly whose last name, there is no way that I can pronounce, but when I, no way. Um, but I think that more, everybody knows whom I'm talking about. He came up with the, with the concept of, of the flow, which means that you're immersed in the experience. You reach a level of very deep meditation. And for these, scuba divers, it's worth the all ener energetic sports. This is what they're looking for. They're not looking for risk. They're looking for this incredible experience. This is from our scuba divers. Now, I will just mention in a minute that we did some studies 
uh, or my friend did some studies about uh, political tourism on the West Bank, and they found out that there was no risk involved because it was all, all, all uh, orchestrated every week in the same manner. So the political tourists knew exactly how to proceed and when uh, um, um, smoke grenade will be operating, etc., etc. So if you can enlarge the picture, you can see the minute where these grenades are operated, but every week it was the same thing, and yet political tourists they, they flocked there, and they were very satisfied with this so-called risky type of tourism. And um, on this note, I would like to get to the end of the presentation. As you can see, I can take for I can talk forever about this, these interesting issues. Um, so risk is not always negative to the tourist experience. Risk in a way is often sought after. People are looking for risk because they get some satisfaction of it. Risk as a side effect can be controlled, okay? It can be mitigated. And we often manipulate our risk in my mind. As I said, we tell ourselves stories to rationalize our behavior. That's how we are. And finally, the last word, risk is not necessarily irrational, okay? So these are the, I think, the major conclusions, conclusions of what I've been trying to convey in this presentation. And finally, I would like to thank you for your patience to follow me and to listen to me. So it's been a very interesting journey for me from the year of 2000 up to these days, following Abe's conceptualization. And you can see how we branched out with other colleagues that can be like the, the grandchildren of Abe, like through me, how they were developed into independent researchers. And it's been a real pleasure and honor. So thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Ari. That, that, that was fascinating. You, you'll be pleased to know that we've got many questions for you. Okay. Um, we haven't got a huge amount of time, but I think we've, we've got enough time to, to fire away. In fact, the, the first three are all COVID related. And these are from Denver uh, Sievert, one of my colleagues here, Aviad Israeli. Hello, Aviad. And Asli, uh, Dr. Asli Tusky. And it's really how do you think COVID and its aftermath may shape some of your views in terms of the risking or the perceptions of risk? How may COVID shape the future uh, of your work? To be honest with you. Please be honest. <laughs> in two years, it will, uh, will be like the flu. It will be as risky as the flu. That's what I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're not convinced it's ultimately going to reshape our behavior longer I, term? I read a lot of what is being written on Trinet and in other venues about major changes in the tourism industry as a result of the, of the COVID pandemic, et cetera. But I don't see any reason why, given the development of vaccines, why should people change their behavior? I mean, we can promote the policy of being more attuned to environmental issue. Fine, but it has nothing to do with the virus. I mean, we should be more attuned to it. We should 
now be sensitive to the issue of overcrowding, etc. But again, I think it has nothing to do with the virus. I think that in two years it will be controlled and it will be like other plagues, you know, that inflicted humankind. Thank you, Aaron. I, I've got a further question, then I'll pass on to my colleagues. It was interesting, you, you chose the example of the Sinai between Israel and Egypt. And I was thinking, certainly if you look at the United States at the moment, but I could include Britain, I could include Italy, maybe Spain. We've got a lot of political animosity within countries, not between countries, it's within countries. Do you think your findings for Israel and Egypt will be similar maybe for internal or domestic tourism in the US or in Britain or in Spain, where you've got this huge division for a variety of reasons? How do you see it within countries rather than across? Well, I don't remember who wrote it, but I read once an article about animosity between Dutch people and German tourists. When, but when it came to tourism, there was also a kind of bubble, okay, of uh, good manners, uh, so-called nice behavior. So I believe that there is an incredible power to, I would say, financial issues. And I think that when tourism involves uh, financial games, I think that the uh, motivation to, to be more civilized, how shall I put it, gets stronger. I think so. It cannot eradicate animosity, but I think that it can uh, lower the fire, so to speak. Lovely. Thank you, Ari. Uh, Tika. Thank you, Alan. I would like to go to, to Abe. I mean, Abe, you have listened to what Ari kind of described, starting from your, your framing the, the, the problem and, and, and the con conceptualization of risk. And you have seen the evolution of that, the domains, uh, talking about flow. Did anything of this evolution of the concept, you know, kind of struck you that is, kind of going to a dead end or do you think that it has really from your perspective has really enriched the concept and you know contribute to how we should perceive risk uh, from the tourism perspective and thank you Tico um, I have a similar conclusion about the future of the tourism industry in two or three years from now uh, however I do think uh, that the issue of risk and especially health related risk has not been addressed properly in the academic literature. Mm -hmm. Not only it has not been addressed in the academic literature, but our industry was caught with its pants down. We were not prepared for that type of disaster. Uh, neither the United States nor any other country in the world experienced such an event in their history. And therefore, we have to take collectively, both the educator, the scholars, and the industry, steps so that will not happen again. And the first step that we need to understand is that we don't really understand people's health-related behavior, which is different than terrorism behavior, than safety uh, and security behavior, and so forth. I can tell you that three days ago, I did an interview uh, on television uh, about the Royal Caribbean starting a risk-taking cruise. They are looking for volunteers to go on their ships and test whether their arrangements 
are proper and not risky. In other words, it's like volunteering for getting a disease and then getting a vaccine to see if the vaccine worked. In those three days, I, who was just the interviewer, I already got a plethora of questions asking me, where do I volunteer? Because people are willing to take those risks. And the question is, are they really illogical? Are they really, you know, risk takers or sensation seekers or anything like that? And we do see those people in hotels. Do we see people flying the airlines nowadays? So obviously the health related risk literature is minor. Uh, it has been uh, done on a very small scale with Ebola, with H1N1 uh, and so forth, but on a minor scale. Now you see it growing exponentially and people are interested in that. They want to, you know, get that issue understood. And of course, there is also the political side because a health related risk, at least in this country and some of the other countries has been politicized. And now those people who are acting risky are showing their support for a philosophy or a political uh, stream. So in my opinion, this stream of research has to increase and will increase and we need to better understand and prepare for future events like that. Ari, I have a, I have a uh, thank you, Abe. I have a question for Ari. What I understood from your presentation, there are two steps in the process. One is a person appraise whether there's risk. And then the other is the negotiation that you uh, undergo with yourself, whether that is a risk that I should take or not. And I, I didn't really get the impression that we know as much about that second part, about how that person negotiate with itself in order to say, well, I will take it, that particular risk in tourism. Okay. And I did not um, emphasize differences between the studies that I presented but some of them inquired about risk perceptions of destinations before the visit. Others measured risk perception on the visit, that is to say during the visit, okay? However, so far, we haven't conducted any study where you follow the group, let's say a sample of people, where you measure the risk perception of a, a let's say of a destination before the decision, then while on the destination and after the visit. I don't know about any studies con conducted this way. And uh, we found from our study that uh, interviewing people while the, on the visit, okay, gave you incredible information, okay? And um, in some cases, we asked about the past before the visit and frankly, there was a lot of criticism, methodological criticism about the way that we measured it. There was recently a highly critical paper about some of our measurement by Sven Larsen and colleagues from Bergen University in Norway. And uh, they criticized us about looking backward and phrasing question about risk in terms I was worried about or something like this. They highly criticized the approach. 
So I'm not sure that I answered your question though. Thank you, Ari, I think you did. And um, I'm looking at the time right now and I think we are slowly approaching the conclusion of our session today. So I would like to um, conclude this interesting session thanking uh, you for attending and a special thanks to Dr. Ari Reichel. We will see each other again at our next Abraham Pizam Distinguished Lecture Series on December 10th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time or New York Time with our special guest, Dr. Brian King from the Hong Kong Polytech University. The title of his lecture is Does Tourism Scholarship has a post-pandemic future reflection on academic practice across three continents. Thank you. Please stay safe until the next time. Thank you, Aria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aria. Thanks. It was a real pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thanks, Aria. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.